Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our present quarterly chairman for this last quarter of this great bicentennial year, 1976, Mr. J. Dennis Bonney, Vice President, Standard Oil Company of California. Mr. Bonney. Thank you, Mr. Bates. I particularly appreciate the personal honor of being selected as your chairman and look forward with great enthusiasm to the next three months. I find it a particularly pleasant duty today that my first, the first guest whom I have the honor to introduce as quarterly chairman is a gentleman from a country that I've had the pleasure of visiting a number of times. We're pleased to present as our luncheon speaker, His Excellency Adesha Zahedi, Ambassador of Iran to the United States. Ambassador Zahedi's, Zahedi's country has a long tradition of friendship and cooperation with the United States. And it is also, as I think all of us know, of increasing economic importance to the United States as one of the largest producers of oil in the world today and the exporter of over 500,000 barrels a day of oil to this country. Ambassador Zahedi was educated at the American College in Beirut and Utah State University. He also has honorary doctorates from a number of U.S. universities. He entered government service in Iran in 1950 and has served in many positions of high distinction, including foreign minister and ambassador to Great Britain and Mexico, as well as to the United States. He's been the recipient of numerous honors, not only from his own government, but also from more than a score of other countries in four continents. He first served as ambassador to the United States in the period 1959 to 1961, including the year 1960, and the fact that he is now here on his second term, I think, ranks him as a connoisseur of debates between presidential candidates. It is a great honor to present the, His Excellency Adesha Zahadi, who will talk today about U.S.-Iran relations. President John Bates, Mr. Chairman Bonney, a distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how happy and how privileged I am to be back here again in this lovely city of San Francisco, which uh, once, as a young, young boy, I used to go to school. Of course, I have been here many times ever since. And also how honored I am uh, to be asked by such a distinguished gathering to come here today and talk for you. I have not prepared the speech. I thought I shall try to talk to you, uh, some as short as possible, of course, because I know that the time is limited about my country and my country's relationship uh, with the neighboring countries, about uh, my country's foreign policy, and then in the last part I shall talk about the relationship between uh, United States of America and Iran. I have uh, once read a book by Mr. Ernest Stowe, which in that uh, book, Guide to the Diplomatic uh, Practice, it says that Ambassador is an honest man who has sent to abroad to uh, lie about the good of his country. <laughs> I am um, not sure whether that would fit me or not, because first of all, I am not a career diplomat, and secondly, uh, with often think that uh, I'm not sure whether uh, sometime I'm Iranian or American and wearing a hat, uh, sometime as Iranian, sometime as American, being in this country and seeing your 
generosity and your hospitality. Uh, so I think I shall uh, try to be, uh, not to be an ambassador, not to be a career diplomat, but try to be as honest and as candid I can uh, to talk to you about my country. Uh, we have, and you have heard of Iran or Persia. Uh, many of you may have had uh, a chance to see my country. Many of you have seen many of our Iranian, either students or the businessmen in this country. Uh, but yet I have noticed that sometimes uh, we do not know much about Iran. So I thought uh, very shortly I shall bring it to your attention uh, what is Iran and what is our background. Of course, as you know, Iran was known as a cradle of civilization. We have a history of about over 12,700 years. We had our exhibition in about 10 years ago, archaeologist exhibition for about 7,300 years. And just about five, six years ago, uh, we celebrated our 2,000 500th anniversary of our kingdom. Iran is the size of about one-fifth of the United States of America, the present Iran. Of course, the Persian Empire, which in the old days started from India to Egypt. But the present Iran is actually a size of about one-fifth of the United States, or we can say is the size of France, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Holland, Britain, and Italy, if they would have been combined. The per capita income of Iran today is about $2,000, which about 20 years ago, it was less than $60. We have a GNP of about uh, $52 billion, which at the present time uh, we have committed ourselves for last two years and next three years about $11 billion, $700 million to aid to the other countries. Iran foreign policy is what we call it uh, independent national policy. And that is that we would like to have close relationship uh, with all the countries, neighboring countries, as well as the countries in different parts of the globe, regardless of what kind of the regime and what kind of the system they have, as long as uh, they would have the respect for our laws and regulation, as long as they would not put their nose in our business and we also believe that we should not put our nose in their business. Iran is a member of two pacts. One is known as a cent, uh, RCD, which is economical pact between Iran, Turkey, and Pakistan, which is rather young, about 11 years old. And I remember in the beginning when it started, uh, the press in Europe, they call it a uh, baby uh, common wealth. And then we are in another pact, which is known as CENTO. It used to be known as Baghdad Pact uh, until 1958 revolution in Iraq, which Great Britain, United States of America, Turkey, Pakistan, and Iran are the member of that pact. And this is actually a defense pact. Iran has got two, uh, we have got a lot of minerals, of course, in my country. We have a lot of mountains, we have a lot of deserts, but uh, two important things is at the present time. One is the oil, which I think is the second largest in the world, and we have about 65 to 70 billion barrel of oil reserved, which at the present time, uh, daily about over five million barrel uh, we are producing. And also uh, another great thing which has been found it's a copper, which uh, now uh, we have realized that the copper which we have in Iran is more uh, than you will have in Zambia or in Chile. Iran is located rather 
uh, as you will see in the map behind me, although I have been warned that I should not look back to the map because you will have trouble to hear me, uh, so I shall not, but you will get the idea. Iran is located between many countries. Uh, one of those countries, which I shall start from the north, is the Soviet Union. We have about 1,500 miles of the border with the Soviet Union, which I think is the second largest country after China who has the border uh, with uh, Soviet Union. We have had a lot of sad experience with our neighboring in the north uh, for last so many hundred of years. Iran had two wars with Soviet Union, or I would say the, the Russian, because this is before the time of the communist regime, which one lasted for about 10 years, and the other lasted for about 11 years and a half. In that two wars, we have lost 37 cities, the north eastern part of the country and the west northwestern part of our country. Because of that sad experience we had in the past, when the communist regime and in beginning the Bolshevik came to Soviet Union, uh, we were the first country who recognized uh, the communist regime in order that we hoped that we will have a better understanding with our neighbor in the north. Uh, however, uh, that uh, didn't last uh, too long, and we had another problem, and that is, uh, which most of you probably remember, the crisis of Azerbaijan, which is the states in the northwestern part of our country, which after the occupation, although Iran was uh, not in war, Iran was uh, uh, not taking anybody's sides in that war, uh, which later on, of course, it became allied with the allied country. But that time, we have been attacked by the Soviets and the British from the north and the south. And after that, uh, there was a puppet government uh, which was uh, helped by the Soviets in that part, Azerbaijan, which we have been able to get rid of that puppet government, and I think it's the first ever since the World War II, a country being able uh, to get out of the hand of the communist uh, without uh, actually uh, having a problem which we have seen in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, or in Korea, or in Vietnam. And proudly, I can tell you, without receiving a single dollar, a single bullet, a single gun, or a single soldier from the United States. But it was the help of the United States, of America, it was the help of the other, other allied, and it was a determination of our beloved sovereign and determination of the brave people of Azerbaijan, which we have been able to get rid of that puppet regime. At the present time, uh, we have a rather business-like or a normal relationship. Uh, Sometimes they underestimate uh, the love of our people uh, for our country, uh, so uh, we have some time to ta challenge each other, uh, but we have to make it very clear to them uh, that uh, they have to be uh, knowing what country and what people they are dealing with uh, of course, they are a great power, they are among the superpower, but we shall defend our land until our last uh, drop of blood. Then you come to a country which is known as Afghanistan, which once used to be part of the Persian Empire, and then it was under the British uh, uh, domination. Uh, very gladly, uh, this country is independent, they do talk Persian or Iranian, and we have a very close relationship with them. It's a country which is terribly important uh, for the peace of the area. It is between Soviet Union, China, and then in the south with Pakistan. This is why, although we had problems for 98 years 
of the Helmand uh, River, uh, we decided that we should give in. Uh, we decided that if anything goes to our brothers and sisters in that country uh, for the peace, it would worth it. So we have solved that problem. Uh, in one day, I remember, my king, we flown twice uh, between Kabul and uh, Rawalpindi in Pakistan to bring peace between the, these two neighboring nations. And this is why we have committed ourselves that we are giving them more than $1,280,000,000 of aid and technical aid for their economic and also for their agriculture and also for industries of that country. And we hope by doing this we would be able uh, to help them to build and rebuild their country. They are very brave people. Uh, they are very determined for their own independence. At the same time, since they are isolated, uh, we have given them all the facilities which they could have through Iran uh, to the free world, either through our ports in the south, in Persian Gulfs, or through the north part going to Turkey and then from Turkey to Europe. Then we come to uh, Pakistan and India, which again once was the part of the Persian Empire, and then later on under the hand of the British, and now they are two separate states. Uh, Pakistan, it's terribly, imp uh, terribly important for us, uh, for the security of the area, for the security of Indian Ocean, and because of that, and also we have such a historical relationship with both these countries. Uh, we have committed ourselves about over 13, 1 billion, 300 million uh, dollar to India and about uh, 1 billion, uh, 50 million dollar to Pakistan on aid and soft loans, which we thought by this we would be influence both countries to have a peace with each other and we have the guarantee from both that uh, they would not interfere in each other business. We have explained uh, very strongly to India that we cannot accept any more partition of Pakistan. Uh, we have actually uh, told them that we cannot accept another Vietnam in our neighboring country, and we hope and we pray uh, that uh, we will be able to continue by this uh, peaceful negotiation to have a good relation with this country to help these countries as well as we believe by helping them, we are helping ourselves. With India, of course, uh, we have had one problem. As you know, India had a 20 years treaty with the Soviet Union on the defense and also on uh, cooperation. And on the Indian Ocean, our policy has been uh, that uh, Indian Ocean should be actually handled by all the countries around the Indian Ocean. However, uh, that is a rather tricky thing to say because uh, unless all the countries, whether it would be China, Japan, Australia, all the nations in those parts of uh, the world, uh, they have to come to understanding in order that you would have the peace and you would have the cooperation for keeping the peace. But as long as we do not have that understanding among those nations, we do not see any reason why the Soviet Union, although it is not a country which has directly linked with the Indian Ocean, should be active and so active recently in the Indian Ocean and the United States of America should not be present there. So this is the thing which we have explained to our neighbors, especially to India. We come to the southern part of Iran, which part of it is in Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Oman, uh, the Sea of Oman, and part of it is in the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf, it's terribly important for us as well as the free, for the free world. As you know, Japan would get about 93% of their oil from the Persian Gulf until about six months ago, and now they will get about 84 to 86% of their oil from the Persian Gulf. Europe would get somewhere between 75 to 78% of the oil from Persian Gulf. And the United States of America would get between 25 to 30% of their oil. Of course, that some months is higher, some months is lower from the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf, it's 
important. And as you know, until uh, less than 11 years ago, it was the presence of the British in the Persian Gulf. When they left, we have actually said that the Persian Gulf security should be on the hand of the countries who are around the Persian Gulf. Of course, in, among these countries, some of them, they just have become independent. Some of these countries have a population not more than 16,000 people, some of them about seven or 800,000, but the most, the biggest, not more than 2 million. Some of them are rich and some of them are poor, and some of these countries live in a way as they would have lived in 16 or in 17 century. We have explained to these countries uh, we would be glad to help them, and we would be glad, glad to help them if they need for the defense or economical aid or technical aid, and we have tried to influence these countries that they should have social reforms so it would be good for them as well as for us. I'm sure many of you have heard about Mascat and Oman and the fight which has been going on for the last two years in Dofar by the help of the communists, and mostly they were getting their ammunition and their backing from the country known as South Yemen. We cannot and we shall not tolerate any of these kind of things, activities in that part because our economy lies there. Uh, it is actually our nick, and this is why uh, we had been active uh, to be strong, especially to learn uh, from the mistakes in the past, that whenever we have not been strong enough, uh, we have been a victim, uh, whether in the time of the Portuguese or later on the British. If you look in these countries, uh, you come uh, after you go to the uh, United Arab Emirate or these little sheikdoms, which I earlier brought to your attention, one of the countries which is known as, Iraq, uh, as Kuwait, Kuwait is actually uh, has a population about seven to 800,000. Uh, about one third of the population is almost Kuwaitis and the rest are foreigners, either the Iraqi, Palestinians, or the Indians, or Pakistanis, or the Iranian. Uh, they have got more than four billion dollars a year of profit from the oil. Uh, you can fly over this country less than four to five minutes by aeroplane from the north to the south or from the east to the west. And the only cities in these uh, states is Kuwait itself as a capital and the Hamidiye, which is the center of the oil. Uh, our relationship actually have started uh, more than 99 years ago. Howard Basketville, who came to Iran and fought with the Iranian those days which we were fighting against the dictatorship and we wanted to have a parliamentary system. Schuster, which came to Iran as a specialist to help us to build our economy. And also Dr. Jordan, who came to Iran, who started American College. Uh, this is the era before the World War I. On the Second World War, between the First and the Second, uh, we had also cooperation, most of the missionary, and then it came to the third stage, which is from after the World War II. Of course, it was your help, as I earlier mentioned, uh, which we have been able uh, to bring back a part of the country on, uh, which was dominated by the communists. In the first stage, ever since the war, we have been completely dependent on your help, technically, economically, and militarily. As a matter of fact, I myself was the witness as I started point four in Iran those days with $500,000 a year from your country. The second stage was actually we were buying part of the equipment uh, by loan and part we were getting as a technical assistant. The last stage, which is at the present time, is actually uh, now we are actually whatever we buy from United States and we prefer to do it from here. We pay for it cash, and I'm very proud and very glad uh, to say uh, that we have the best relationship that ever existed between our two nations. Uh, today, as you know, uh, two years ago, we had the treaty between Iran and United States, which would bring to United States of America about $15 billion, and this has jumped about a few months ago to about $48 billion, 
which would come to the United States on different fields, education, in agribusiness, in uh, industry, in know-how, uh, which is a big field, but since I have a very short time, I would uh, not be able to go into the detail, but I would be glad to answer questions which later on I come to it. One thing I would like to say before I finished, since I have lived among your people, since I have received the hospitality, and I think uh, I am among the one which actually could judge uh, of who you are and what you have done. I have seen in many countries, when I was foreign minister or a roving ambassador or traveling, in Asia, in China, in South America, in Africa, in Europe. You have always helped with your generosity many nations, which one of them was my own. You have a wonderful quality which you try to pinch on yourself. You try to uh, say what you have done wrong and sometimes you have the frustration. But as a foreigner, I would want you to allow me to tell you that it is good to criticize yourself, but at the same time you should remember what you have done for the countries from Japan to the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe. Your Marshall Plan to Europe actually has changed the situation in Europe. Your help to Japan, which today even they are uh, making competition with you economically. This is something you should do and you should be proud of what you have done, and always with your generosity, always with your kind helps to the other nations. You have never asked them, and you have never put any string attached. So while you are actually sometimes mad with yourself, and cross with yourself, and pinch yourself, don't ever forget what you have done for the few, uh, for the free world, and be proud of it, and don't go in one side which would destroy the mentality and the morale of the young generation. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and I would be most happy to answer any question. I'm sorry I was trying to be rather fast, but uh, since I heard that I have only 27 minutes and that is up, so I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I would li now like to request Mr. Jack Bates, President of the Commonwealth Club of California, to preside over the question period. Mr. Bates. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Barney. Quite a few questions. Most interesting talk, Mr. Ambassador. I wish we could give you another 27 minutes on that. Uh, perhaps we'll get more insight now as we ask you these questions from our membership. Um, should Iranian economic development have second place after Iranian military development? What should determine the balance expenditures for these purposes? Actually, our military expenses, if you look into our budget, it's about one-fifth, about uh, uh, four times of our budget goes to developing a country. Uh, we do not have any other choice, as earlier I have mentioned to you, uh, not to spend for our military, otherwise uh, we would be the victim of the enemies, as I have actually explained to you earlier. As my sovereign has said it many times, we wish and we hope someday when we would have the disarmament of all of the world, we would not have spent even a single dollar for the military and we would have spent that money for our welfare and the social reforms. But today we cannot afford to do so, and especially when we look around, seeing what has happened in Asia, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, or in the Middle East, or in Africa. Is there any basis uh, for Saudi Arabia's alleged fear that Iran might attack it? I think it would be rather ridiculous if they would fear Iran attack. Uh, today we have seen that the Arabs are fighting among themselves, and we have always tried to help them. Earlier I have mentioned that we have offered our help to them. I think uh, if I give you one example, which I was actually in that period of time, 
Bahrain Islands, which has been belong to Iran more than 3,000 years. Uh, later on, it has been taken by the Portuguese and then by the British. Uh, of course, under circumstances for last 150 years, there has been many Arabs, and it's also close to the Saudi Arabia. Being realistic, seeing what is happening in Cyprus, and do not want to enforce people if they do not want to be part of Iran, we have went out of our way. We suggested that if the wish of the people of Bahrain is to be independent, uh, we would respect it. Uh, we went by the help of the United Nations. We had referendum, and in that referendum, the people wanted to be independent. We accepted it. I was the one that time as a foreign minister, which I made my speech in the parliament, as well as in the United Nations. Today, we have the best relationship with Bahrain, and we are trying to help them economically, as well as technically, and we are even ready to help them on their defense. Uh, we would like to have our relationship with Saudi Arabia as well, because we believe that uh, peace in the area is important and it should be in the hand of the all governments concerned. Now, since this question come up and I was talking about the Iraqi thing, it might be interesting to see. We are trying to help and keep the peace there, and here is the nation which Iran, as I brought it to your attention, is only about uh, our population is about over 34 million, and Iraq's population is only 20 million. They are today receiving a scope B and frog, which is a surface-to-surface -surface, uh, missile, which Iran does not have it at all. They are having TU-22, TU-16, IL-28, which is a long-range bomber, which Iran does not have it at the present time. They are having TU-22, which actually already is operation. So they should not actually fear Iran if they are going to fear, but they have to fear the others, which all the time they are fighting with themselves. We are going to get, actually there are more than 3,000 fighters, including MiG-23, which are already operating in Iraq, which we are going to get F-14s, and we have actually will get the first one already delivered, but the next two or three would not be delivered before 16 or 17 months. So I think uh, this is a joke, and I'm sorry I used that word, but I don't think Saudi Arabia has to worry about uh, uh, anything against from Iran. <clears throat> um. This member asks, uh, uh, why does Iran not support the Arab position regarding Israel? Um, as I have brought it to your attention, the foreign policy of Iran is based as independent national policy. Uh, we do support Arabs vis-a-vis -vis Israel. However, uh, the, what we are saying is this, and again, I was that time foreign minister of His Majesty, which I made my speech after the 67 war. We always believed and we believe that the Israel has the right to exist and the right to live. Uh, at the same time, we have condemned any country, Israel or any countries, big or small, would take other nations' land by force because we believe this uh, would not be able to continue to have the peace in the world. We believe, as a matter of fact, Iran again was among the country which brought resolution 242 and 338 of the Security Council resolution. And these two, I believe, uh, would be the answer of the peace in the Middle East. At the same time, we have to be honest with ourselves and to bear our, uh, to our mind that if we would not be able to solve the question of Palestinian, uh, the peace would not be there. But we have actually supported them the way which we thought it's wise and the way we thought that everybody has right to live in the, this world which we want to have a free world. <clears throat> How many people have been executed for violation of Iran's narcotic laws, and has this been an effective control method? I do not remember how many really, I don't think very many, but it has been terribly effective because what we believe <laughs> – 
what we believe, those people who are addict, uh, they are the victims of the group of people whom they make money and they become multimillionaires. And these are the danger for all of us, no matter what religion, what country, and which part of the world you are. We believe these people who carries the narcotics and give it to these innocent young boys and young girls are actually a crim criminal. We have passed the law, and this is why we have act those who have been cut, uh, they have been executed. What is Iran's position on the problems of black majority rule in South Africa? Uh, we have been always against uh, the discrimination against the black. If you look into the history of Iran, it goes back to about 2,500 years ago, which uh, we have always said freedom of thought, freedom of religion, and Iran is the only country which in the record did not have any slavery. As a matter of fact, in those days, Cyrus the Great, which has still in these golden plates, uh, said that those who threw the Jews into the mouth of the lion are the those who should be thrown into the mouth of the lion. We believe that South Africa and Rhodesia should take a rather uh, realistic uh, view into the situation. We believe they should have done it in the past. At the same time, we believe uh, the action should be such a way uh, that neither side would be harmed and destroyed. We hope by the talk which has started, and we hope now uh, especially the South Africans has woke up and they would be able without a war, without destroying other human beings which then might be the, the whites which are going to suffer. We believe by talks and by the help of, of other nations we would be able to bring uh, this equality in that part of the world. But we have been always against the appetite in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, Arjur Zahadi, we very much appreciate your taking the time and effort to come here and appear before our membership today. I have, I have one more question, but before asking it, and on behalf of our members who are assembled here at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, and also on behalf of the more than 13,000 other members uh, scattered throughout the country who may well be listening to your broadcast uh, over more than 100 radio stations. Uh, I do want to, want to thank you very much. We are indeed honored by your presence. Uh, you have given us a, a very keen and, and candid insight into Iran, its neighbors, and its problems. I, I think in what you said about the United States, Mr. Ambassador, you seem to be as good an ambassador for the United States as for your own beloved country. And now, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I also want to uh, comment to our membership that among all these other honors, he is the man of the year of um, Kappa Sigma fraternity. So that shows what, uh, how he's recognized by us here in the United States. My last question, Mr. Ambassador, you have established a reputation as being the leading uh, international eligible bachelor. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you have any intentions of uh, changing that distinction? <laughs> well, I, I actually had uh, enjoyed being a bachelor and uh, <laughs> having the privilege and uh, honor to be with such a wonderful, lovely ladies in this country. Uh, I think a life uh, without a, a, a woman is very empty, and I, uh, I, I don't think I shall change that uh, line, and I, sh I think I should continue the same line I am. And I'm very honored to be among you here, and I'm very honored to see so many beauties also among the audience here. Thank you very much.